I am two monkeys and a Jojo, and I identify as trash radio. It's easy to take for granted the immediacy of what you can find online these days, for better and for worse. Before broadband internet, sure, you could find porn, guns, drugs, and gore. But gore sort of only happened incidentally. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that footage of beheadings, stonings, necklacings, industrial accidents, 17 car pileups on a highway where you see something that looks like mounds of uncooked meat in a flannel shirt with a scalp and an eyeball dangling out of some wet chasm that once resembled a person's face all wrapped up in a flannel shirt sticking out the windshield of an 85 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. You see, once upon a time, we had to sit around and wait for terrorism. No, I'm serious. You see, people like Daniel Pearl and Nick Berg were beheaded, and then it ended up on the news, and then the rest of the world found the uncensored versions online. The story of Daniel Pearl and eh, kind of fucked up, but a sign of the times that were coming, not already there. Nick Berg, on the other hand, that's a, kind of a fucking mess, but we'll get to that. Keep your pants on. He vanishes on January 23rd, 2002, in Karachi. His captors made a video titled The Slaughter of the Spy Journalist, the Jew Daniel Pearl. The video made its way to the Pakistani government and the U.S. government, and eventually it leaked onto the internet through a jihadist site. It consists of a Pearl monologue describing his Jewish upbringing, his family's involvement with the creation of the State of Israel, and his feelings regarding its history. His monologue is presented in edited sound. At times, he appears relaxed and his speech is natural, but during other parts, he is tense and his speech sounds forced. Most of what he says is not terribly controversial at the time, and notably, he does not claim to be a spy for the United States or Israel. He answers a question from someone off camera. And he responds, Yes, I am a Jew, and my father was a Jew. And then his throat is cut. According to published reports, when his throat was first slashed, a technical error caused it to not be captured on film. In the video, Pearls' corpse is shown naked from the waist up. Laying on a blanket, a man's arm is holding his head forward so that his cut neck cannot be seen. With the knife in his other hand, the man proceeds to cut deeper into Pearl's neck, from the back to the front. There is little blood. The man holding the knife is now strongly believed to have been Khalid Sheikh Mohammed the then chief of military operations for Al-Qaeda. The remaining 90 seconds of the video consists of a list of demands scrolling by, superimposed over a picture of Pearl's severed head being held by the hair. 
Among the list is a demand for delivery of American F-16s paid for but never received by the Pakistani government. Here's a transcript of the English text in the video. National Movement for the Restoration of Pakistan Sovereignty. We still demand the following. The immediate release of U.S.-held prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The return of Pakistani prisoners to Pakistan. The immediate end of U.S. presence in Pakistan. The delivery of F-16 planes that Pakistan had paid for and never received. We assure Americans that they shall never be safe on the Muslim land of Pakistan. And if our demands are not met, this scene shall be repeated again and again. Three suspects were caught after the FBI traced emails announcing the kidnapping back to the laptop which sent them. The suspects were members of lashkar e Jangi, a Pakistani terrorist group with ties to Al-Qaeda, whose membership is closely linked to both Khalid Sheikh and his nephew Ramzi Yusa. The group is also linked to Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian terrorist who is now credited to be the founder of ISIS. Um, that's kind of bullshit, but that's what shows up if you Google it, scroll down for a little bit. Anyways, this guy, he made the videotape beheading his personal trademark. The Daniel Pearl killing was notable for kicking off an industry boom in terrorist snuff films that continues to this day. Fun fact, on May 23rd, 2002, the FBI orders an ISP to remove the Daniel Pearl video from its servers, citing an obscenity law passed in 1996. Such behavior is an undisputable attempt at intimidation, as obscenity obviously does not apply to such a video. After some bad publicity, the FBI backed off a faceless claim. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed. As twas were a careless trifle. There is an Anatomy of the Heads album you don't know you love. You have yet to purchase. So when you do, understand you are helping them get one step closer to touring the United States. The DVD will come with bonus footage including Michael Van Gore filming Jay Heidenreich and the Fisherman scrolling on Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge as they both look on in low-key bewilderment how and why so many doctors, lawyers, nurses, and even a few higher education teachers are such freaks. Armchair decapitators critiqued the video in tiresome detail, and thousands of jerks posted their knowledge and their viewpoints on what a decapitation ought to look like. In the view of these experienced professionals, Berg's death was clearly a CIA hoax, possibly pulled off with the assistance of Mossad. More serious-minded observers had questions when then Attorney General John Ashcroft revealed that Berg had accidentally provided a computer password to accused Al-Qaeda operative Zacharias Musai 
who just happened to be linked to the aforementioned Zarqawi. The tough probing eyes of U.S. journalism immediately dropped the entire case and devoted their newscasts to Scott Peterson and Michael Jackson, and no one ever spoke of it again. When Shakespeare wrote those lines about the fane of Cawdor, he was referring to a character so inconsequential to the plot of Macbeth that he never even appears on stage. The saga of Nick Berg is a different kind of story. Although nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it, his gory decapitation was front page news. In 2006, during a brief blip of time, more people witnessed the death of Nick Berg than any single man since John F. Kennedy, an American businessman taken hostage in Iraq and killed by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Berg's death was captured on video games and became the center of an overnight conspiracy sensation. Armchair decapitators critiqued the video in tiresome detail, and thousands of jerks posted their knowledgeable opinions on what a decapitation ought to look like. In the view of these experienced professionals, Berg's death was clearly a CIA hoax, possibly pulled off with the assistance of Mossad. More serious-minded observers had questions when then-Attorney General John Ashcroft revealed that Berg had, quote, accidentally, end quote, provided a computer password to the aforementioned Zarqawi. The tough probing eyes of United States journalism immediately dropped the entire case and devoted their newscasts to Scott Peterson and Michael Jackson, and no one ever spoke of it again. A quick note, the Daniel Pearl killing video is not as gruesome or horrifying as you'd think it is. Due to an over-enthusiastic editor and technical problems during filming, the Nick Berg video, which surfaced in early 2004, was a much more effective presentation. Although the production values were skimpy compared to the Pearl video, the actual beheading was presented much more effectively. A simple head-on perspective, accompanied by the blood-curdling screams of the assassin. The video was released shortly after that clusterfuck in Abu Ghraib prison became public, and it was initially characterized as revenge for the humiliating images of Iraqi prisoners suffering at the hands of American soldiers. The plot thickened quickly, however. Initially described as a U.S. contractor, Berg was subsequently discovered to be an independent businessman. His reasons for being in Iraq were extremely vague. Then it turned out he had been imprisoned by Iraqi authorities shortly before his kidnapping. Then it turned out that the FBI had visited his prison cell several times to interrogate him. Concurrently with these revelations, about a million jerks on the internet and plenty more BBS participants began questioning every detail of the video. Some claimed Berg was wearing an orange jumpsuit of the type issued to prisoners at Abu Ghraib. He wasn't. Others claimed he was sitting in a chair that also appeared in some of the prison abuse pictures. He wasn't. Still others claimed the walls of the room where Berg was executed were the same color as the walls at Abu Ghraib. They were. Many viewers of the tape critiqued the actual beheading, arguing there wasn't enough blood or that Berg didn't struggle appropriately. 
These observations are virtually meaningless in light of the low quality of the video. Even if Berg had been sedated or killed before being beheaded, that was hardly a proof of a vast conspiracy. Nevertheless, the speculation flew thick and furious. The most popular opinion among clueless internet dwellers at the time was that the execution was some kind of CIA disinfo psyop. Although the tape offered no imaginable benefit to the CIA, however, even paranoids have enemies. Despite the abundance of irresponsible speculation, the case of Nicholas Berg was indeed strange and suspicious. No, really. Even as the mainstream media abandoned the story, turned off by the conspiracy movements, a few isolated stories emerged and really raised big picture questions about who this guy was and what the fuck he was doing in Iraq. Berg's trip to Iraq wasn't his first encounter with a terrorist, and it wasn't the first time he was interrogated by the FBI. In 2000, when Berg was attending college in Norman, Oklahoma, he apparently just happened to run into a certified Al-Qaeda terrorist while riding the bus. Zacharias Musai, the alleged 20th hijacker of the attacks on September 11, 2001, was attending flight school in Norman presumably as part of his training for a future terrorist attack. Somehow or another, Musai obtained Berg's password for the University of Oklahoma computer network. The official story put forward by the Justice Department is that Berg innocently shared his password with Musai on the bus but that there was no other connection between them. While barely within the realm of possibility, it's pretty difficult to swallow this version of events. Nice Jewish boy meets radical Islamic extremist on the bus, and they hit it off so well he turns over his computer password? Get the fuck out of here. It gets worse. Musai also reportedly tied to Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, Berg's future executioner. Before coming to the United States, Musai had lived in London, where he attended a radical Islamic mosque tied to Zarqawi's international terrorist network. The Zarqawi group reportedly maintained active cells in London as well. Furthermore, Musai had been researching materials for a possible chemical weapons attack. And chemical weapons are a Zarqawi specialty. It only gets weirder from there. When Berg was being held in Iraq, for reasons which remain unknown, the FBI had questioned him at some length about whether he knew how to make pipe bombs. The reason for this didn't emerge until several months after his death, when a television news station from Philadelphia reported that Berg might have been a suspect in a 2000 bombing spree in that city, where he lived before going to Oklahoma for college. Unfortunately, the story of Nick Berg has since cooled off considerably in the months since his death and then entirely dropped off the face of the earth, in part because his execution was only the first in a string of deadly decapitations recorded by Iraqi terrorist videographers. No one followed up on the Musai connections in months afterwards of everything quieting down, and none of the national media picked up on the Philly TV report. And then time passed. A lot. Now we're here. Whatever the truth turns out to be, one thing is painfully clear. There is more to the story of Nick Berg than meets the eye. Ironically, the people who were screeching the loudest about the Nick Berg conspiracy 
may have helped bury the story, since Berg's name became inextricably linked with loony tinfoil hat fodder within weeks of his death. Often, the kiss of death as far as any future investigations by the serious media go. Who was Nick Berg? Was he just a very unlucky guy whose karma sent him continually into the paths of terrorists? Or was he something more than he seemed? As Shakespeare would have put it, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. For context, as handheld video recorders became cheaper and more readily available from the late 1980s and on, Islamic extremist and terrorist networks quickly realized their utility. Audio and videotape were used at first to disseminate political and ideological propaganda, mostly incendiary speeches by radical clerics, which were sold and distributed at conferences and mosques. A standout in this regard is the Ayatollah Khomeini, who had mixtapes of him talking the most shit, which were quite popular when he was in exile. Handheld video cameras were occasionally used to record fighting in Afghanistan and other regions where Islamic extremists were active, and in some cases still are, such as the Philippines and around Southeast Asia. But such taping was rare. When the Soviet Jihad ended in 1989, Video also enhanced training in terrorist techniques, such as bomb making. These were still largely internal uses. The explosion of jihadist videos, pun totally intended, as a medium for the masses didn't take place until after the September 11th attacks on the United States. Major media outlets essentially replayed the shocking footage of planes hitting the building, building collapses, people running for their lives, and what the hell, smoldering ruins and the occasional footage of jumpers. So, terrorist groups and their sympathizers recorded these images and digitized them too. Soon, footage of the attacks went into wide circulation over the internet often intercut with speeches by terrorist leaders of the time, such as Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri. After a while, the videotaped speeches evolved into direct communiques in which terrorist leaders addressed their followers or their enemies. The rapidly growing availability of cheap video cameras combined with an increasing sophistication in online operations led to the situation of the time before broadband internet. The release of terrorist videos on a daily basis, starring anyone from Bin Laden down to the lowliest jihadi. Online videos were disseminated by everyone from the extended Al-Qaeda network to Hamas and Hezbollah to hundred little indie terrorist outfits using the medium to burst onto the scene. With the improved technology, jihadists were able to reach a fairly substantial Muslim and Arabic audience online. Although Western journalists took notice, the public barely blinked until terrorists began beheading captives. Once upon a time, there were a few dedicated Islamist sites that distributed jihadi videos. It's problematic keeping these sites online for very long, since ISP and Western governments have active programs in place to discourage such content. More typically, a video would be linked from an Arabic language message board to another server where the actual video is stored. There, a handful of standing FTP servers dedicated solely to Islamist material, but more often, the terrorists use temporary and anonymous storage solutions, like the gem of yesterday, yousendit.com.
There were even a few terrorist webmasters who started hacking into sites with loose upload policies where they can store the videos until someone notices their presence and deletes them. Such links are ephemeral at first, but then they snowballed once released as sympathizers, news outlets, splatter and gore websites, and anti-terrorist organizations immediately download and mirror them for free. A particularly newsworthy video can be mirrored hundreds of times within a matter within a matter of days. In the present, it's more like a few hours, but again, this was before broadband internet, ladies and jerks, because the videos were so easy to produce, even back then. There was not a lot of consistency in content or format. However, the most widely distributed videos tend to fall into a few distinct categories. The typical terrorist propaganda videos of yore were overproduced montages of powerful still and moving images set to an Islamic religious chant. The images would be just about anything. Pictures of insurgents in action, lovingly crafted portraits of Bin Laden, Zawahiri, and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Any of the unforgettable September 11th scenes, and pictures of Iraqis suffering innumerable indignities at the hands of Americans. For some reason, all these violent scenes are extremely effective at demonizing the quote enemies of Islam, end quote, as the terrorists see them. But the equally graphic and brutal videos of insurgents and terrorists beheading innocent civilians didn't seem to generate as much of a backlash as one might have hoped. Running between five minutes and an hour in length, the propaganda films were sometimes of very high quality, but more often looked extremely amateurish. They tend to feature absurdly excessive computer-generated special effects and titles. Remember way back when you got your first copy of Photoshop, and for the first couple of months, you couldn't resist using six different fonts on every page, with half the words drop-shadowed in the most ridiculous colors you could find? It's like that. Sometimes the titles, featuring Arabic words and terrorist logos cartwheeling around the screen, last considerably longer than the actual content of the video. It was not uncommon to see images of Abu Ghraib prison abuses ripped from media broadcasts, in addition to footage of soldiers killing, maiming, and humiliating Iraqis in a wide variety of settings. Similar images of Israelis brutalizing Palestinians abound. For some reason, all these violent scenes are extremely effective at demonizing the enemies of Islam, as the terrorist sees them. But the equally graphic and brutal videos of insurgents and terrorists Beheading innocent civilians didn't seem to generate as much of a backlash as one might have hoped. Running between five minutes and an hour in length, the propaganda films were sometimes of very high quality, but more often looked extremely amateurish. They tended to feature absurdly excessive computer-generated special effects and titles, Remember way back when you got your first copy of Photoshop, and for the first few months, you couldn't resist using six different fonts on every page, with half the words drop-shadowed in the most ridiculous colors you could find? It's like that. 
Sometimes the titles featuring Arabic words and terrorist logos cartwheeling around the screen last considerably longer than the actual content of the video. My favorite and most bizarre example of extremist propaganda was the rap video Dirty Kufar, credited to Sheikh Terra and his soul Salah crew. Kufar is Arabic for infidel or unbeliever. In the video, hip-hop jihadists bust raps over a montage of dead American troops and collapsing buildings. The beat is catchy, but the lyrics, in Arabic and English, are pretty much what you'd expect. Dirty Kufar, wherever you are. From Kandahar to Ramallah. OBL crew be like a shining star. Like the way we destroy them to tower. Ha ha. Dirty Kufar is just one example of a propaganda machine that at the time was in the process of retooling itself for a Western audience. Around that time, video messages featured English speakers and westernized formats, such as an English language message from the Iraqi existence presented with newsreel style delivery and an accompanying orchestral score. A rarity, since many fundamentalist extremist sects disapprove of non-religious music. Osama bin Laden chose to address the United States directly just before the 2004 presidential election. And in early 2005, new jihadist videos began to appear that featured clips of George W. Bush speaking about Iraq, interspersed with violent scenes and footage from the front lines. Then come the martyrdom videos, which come in two flavors. First, there are video wills, recorded by suicide attackers before they embark on their missions. These are typically low-rent affairs, simply a terrorist talking into the camera about his motivations for carrying out his imminent attack. A classic example is the video will of Ahmed al-Haznawi, one of the 9-11 hijackers who vowed to attack Americans on their home ground and end, quote, the humiliation and subjugation of Muslims, end quote. Video wills have also been left by other terrorists whose attacks were less spectacular. Yes, I know what you're about to say. Relax. The other type of martyrdom format is a tribute video in which others talk about the deceased in glowing terms, accompanied by video clips and still pictures of the individual in question. The 19 September 11 hijackers have been the subject of endless tributes, usually featuring photos originally distributed by the U.S. government and accompanied by news footage of 9-11. One series of videos released under the name Shohada, Arabic for martyr, was a reoccurring series highlighting the sacrifices of various terrorists for the cause of radical Islam. The Shohada videos were hosted by Arabic males sitting in a Johnny Carson-style desk, while inset pictures and graphics highlighted his topics. Some versions of the show are closer to the evening news. Instead of Johnny's friendly coffee cup, however, this talk show host's desk was covered with guns, grenades, and like paraphernalia. The most common terrorist videos used to feature documentary-style footage of terrorist attacks or insurgent military operations, the latter mostly taking place in Iraq and the Palestine territories. The videos usually feature a few brief titles in Arabic, then cut right to the action. The action itself was often blurry, confused, and tedious. Truly exciting battle scenes don't lend themselves to amateur filmmaking. It's much easier to show footage of guys shooting mortars which are presumably aimed at some infidel target or another. Some ambitious auteurs have tried to capture terrorist attacks on airplanes with land-to-air missiles. 
the results were pretty disappointing, although I speak from a strictly cinematic perspective here. For all their flaws, however, those videos were a striking counterpoint to the propaganda images that have glutted Western media since the mid-2000s. Donald Rumsfeld tried to tell us all that the situation in Iraq was under control, but it's a little tough to credit that when you can easily watch jihadis touting shoulder-mounted missiles freely down the streets of Ramadi, while Iraqi civilians line the sidewalks to cheer them on. Hey, remember when Dick Cheney told us that the Iraqis were going to welcome Americans with flowers? All of the formats discussed here have made an impact on target audiences in the Middle East and beyond, but terrorist videos didn't really start to affect audiences in the West until a spate of grisly hostage videos started to flow out of Iraq. The first few beheading videos featured Westerner workers who had been kidnapped by the Zarqawi group. Usually, the group would release footage of the hostage in captivity, often forcing them to read statements or allowing them to make pitiful cries for help. Some of the hostages were softened up for this task by being forced to view their fellow captives being decapitated. The second video, generally, is the money shot, featuring the terrorists reading political statements in Arabic, followed by a beheading. In most of the videos, the captives are decapitated with long serrated knives in order to make the experience as ugly and painful as possible. The executioners sometimes pause halfway allowing the viewer to witness the victim trying to breathe through a severed windpipe before the dirty work is finished. There were a few fatwas by extremist Islamic clerics which recommended that this practice is inhumane and inconsistent with Islam, helpfully recommending that terrorists use sawzals instead of serrated knives in order to preserve the splatter factor while still conforming to the Quranic instruction about merciful executions. While no power saws have surfaced yet, some terrorist groups have switched over to swords or gangland-style pistol executions. You can't stop progress. The beheading and execution videos quickly became a hot commodity online, making the rounds of political and conspiracy websites on the one hand and snuff film archives on the other. Merchants in Iraq can't keep beheading DVDs on the shelves, a sure sign that the initial backlash has faded into near extinction. Although, the method of execution has become less severe in some videos. The body counts have risen sharply. It's not uncommon for a video to feature the execution of three, five, or even ten people at a time. Eventually, ISIS will put this to the test, employing everything from varying calibers of firearms, steamroller, drowning people, setting them on fire, you name it. The victim profile has also shifted, partly due to the restrictions on the movement of Americans in Iraq at the time. Then, videos featured the execution of Turkish truck drivers, and Iraqi civilians accused of collaborating with the U.S. occupation. Chinese, Italian, Japanese, Egyptian, British, Sudanese, Bulgarian, and Korean hostages have been paraded around on video. Their captivity often accompanied by demands that their home government withdraw all support from the provisional Iraqi government. In the run-up to the election on January 30th, 2005, which went off and probably well. A string of videos flowed from Iraq like arterial blood, including all manner of shootings, beheadings, stabbings, bombings, missile attacks, mortar attacks, kidnappings, political assassinations, and the like. Election workers were killed on video. Even candidates were kidnapped and assassinated for the internet's airwaves for lack of a better term. Five minutes after the election concluded, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi declared an all-new and renewed holy war against the new government, now dominated by Shiite Muslims. 
who just happen to be the deadly enemies of the mostly Sunni terrorist cells all over Iraq. Even though the star-making machinery of the Iraqi resistance didn't shut down with Zarqawi's debuts never appearing in the Sundance Film Festival, that didn't stop him from trying. It's probably important to mention Abu Ghraib at this point, so let's get to it, alright? Back in 2003, the White House's website featured a charming little page called Tales of Saddam's Brutality. And this was back in September. You see, the idea behind the page was simple. Overwhelm people with visceral stories of evil Saddam Hussein in order to prop up an increasingly unpopular invasion of Iraq that was originally based on the idea that Saddam was hoarding weapons of mass destruction. By fall 2003, it was starting to look like those weapons were never going to show up. Spoilers, they didn't. So the Bush administration began unsubtly revising history to reflect the fact that the U.S. went into Iraq to get rid of a bad man. Remember when Bush justified it by saying this guy tried to kill his dad? <laughs> Those were good times. After all, no one in George W. Bush's America would dare suggest that the Iraqi people weren't better off with Saddam out the way. And Saddam and sons were pretty atrocious, in the strictly literal sense of authoring atrocities. Indeed, the evidence was all there, in the tales. Perhaps they finally learned their lesson about taking information from the CIA because the tales were all carefully culled from newspaper and media reports. We visited the notorious Abu Ghraib prison outside Baghdad and found written records of prisoners being executed by being put through mincing machines. Saddam Hussein never cut corners when it came to punishment. Abu Ghraib once held thousands of human souls, criminals, political enemies, and those who just happened to get in the way. A 12-year-old Iranian boy visiting his grandmother near Barsa in 1985 was swept up in an Iraqi invasion. He was still there 15 years later. I saw three guards beat a man to death with sticks and cables, one prisoner remembered. When they got tired, the guards would switch with other guards, I could only watch for a minute without getting caught, but I heard the screams, and it went on for an hour. Our hands were tied like this, first the left hand and then the foot, then a black hood on my head, then they applied electricity. That last entry is particularly jarring when you consider that the United States did the exact same thing to an Iraqi prisoner in that now famous picture that pretty much shows up immediately when you Google image Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib was a sprawling 280 acre gulag, complete with sniper towers, razor wire, dungeons, and the stench of human fear. According to the United States Justice Department propaganda released in April 2003 to justify the march towards war, Saddam killed 4,000 prisoners at the institution in 1984 alone. According to U.S. State Department propaganda released in April 2003 to justify the march towards war, Saddam killed 4,000 prisoners at the institution in 1984 and executed no fewer than 50 political prisoners there between 2000 and 2001. You'd think that this represented progress, but to the U.S., it was a reason to invade, well, retroactively, I suppose. Based on all this copious evidence of brutality at Abu Ghraib, the moral case for getting rid of Saddam seemed like a slam dunk, as George Tennant might say. What could possibly go wrong? In March 2004, George W. Bush said, quote, No one can argue that the Iraqi people would be better off with the thugs and murderers back in their palaces. 
end quote. Which, by that time, he should have known better. Because two months earlier, the other shoe had dropped. When the U.S. came storming into the country in spring of 2003, Abu Ghraib was left a smoldering ruin, looted by the local populace as the Saddam regime disintegrated. The Americans came in and thought to themselves, Hey, wouldn't it be great if we used this ghoulish house of horrors for our own prison? You can almost imagine them thinking to themselves, Gee, then people will see how much better we are than those lousy Bathists. Actually, you need not imagine it. When the prison made its debut as an American institution, General Janice Karpinski came right out and said it. Quote, Living conditions now are better in prison than at home. At one point, we were concerned that they wouldn't want to leave. And quote, the general boasted, Let that be a lesson to you all. Never boast. The prison had a peak population of around 15,000 under Saddam. The Americans humanely reduced that number to about 5,000. And in place of Saddam's humiliation and torture... The Americans humanely substituted, well, more humiliation and torture. According to a For Internal Use Only Army report from October to December 2003, U.S. soldiers performed a laundry list of degrading abuses on prisoners at Abu Ghraib. The report offers up the most hardcore details in a U.S. government document since the Star Report. Only much, much uglier. It's hard to actually appreciate the severity of what happened from the sound bites on the evening news at the time, although the pictures get it across pretty well. For a sense of scale, however, try listening to the complete list. And remember, this is just what the military could confirm as having happened. Punching, slapping, and kicking detainees jumping on their naked feet, videotaping and photographing naked male and female detainees, forcibly arranging detainees in various sexually explicit positions for photographing, forcing detainees to remove their clothing and keeping them naked for several days at a time, forcing naked male detainees to wear women's underwear, forcing groups of male detainees to masturbate themselves while being photographed and videotaped, arranging naked male detainees in a pile and then jumping on them, positioning a naked detainee on a MRE box with a sandbag on his head, and attaching wires to his fingers, toes, and penis to simulate electric torture, writing, I am a rapist, on the leg of a detainee, allegedly to have forcibly raped a 15-year-old fellow detainee, and then photographing him naked, placing a dog chain or strap around a naked detainee's neck, and having a female soldier pose for a picture. A male military police guard having sex with a female detainee. Using military working dogs without muzzles to intimidate and frighten detainees, and in at least one case, biting and severely injuring a detainee. Taking photographs of dead Iraqi detainees. Breaking chemical lights and pouring the phosphoric liquid on detainees threatening detainees with a charged 9mm pistol, pouring cold water on naked detainees, beating detainees with broom handles and chairs, threatening male detainees with rape, allowing a military police guard to stitch a wound of a detainee who was injured after being slammed against the wall in his cell, sodomizing a detainee with a chemical light and a broomstick. According to the report, which is a summary of the military's internal investigation of the abuses, soldiers testified that they had been ordered to abuse the prisoners to prepare them for interrogation. 
These orders allegedly came from both military intelligence officers and civilian consultants, members of that class of Iraq warrior ever so euphemistically referred to as private contractors, which is Pentagon speak for paid mercenaries and security experts, to say the least. Perhaps needless to say, whatever orders the service men and women received with respect to softening up the prisoners for interrogation, it's highly unlikely that anyone ordered them to take the garish, jackal-grinning snapshots that have earned them a permanent place in the archives of disturbing illustration. This uniquely American problem required a uniquely American response. The first impulse, as always, was to cover it up. So the military commissioned a report on the abuses, secretly reassigned and charged several enlisted people who had allegedly taken a part in these fucked up and sadistic acts. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there was the little matter of the report and the pictures, especially the pictures. During one of their epic rounds of sexual abuse, a group of male and female soldiers came up with the bright idea to take some photos, souvenirs for their friends and loved ones back home. It's really really hard to imagine how someone could think it was a good idea to document this, but then it's pretty clear from the pictures that we aren't exactly dealing with the intellectual elite of the Iraqi prison system. Among other clues, they misspelled rapist at least two different ways when they were scrawling it on the bodies of their victims with magic marker. In the snapshots, Smirking soldiers gawk and point at the genitalia of naked Iraqi men. In some pictures, the prisoners are forced to simulate sex with each other. In others, they're just piled on top of one another. In almost all the pictures released to date, they're naked. According to news media reports, there are probably more pictures which have yet to surface and probably never will. The report itself was pretty newsworthy, but the pictures ensured that the story would go large. Despite what would seem like an obvious concern, the army sat on the report and did nothing about it for months. Not even after they knew the media was preparing to publish the photos. For two weeks, 60 Minutes 2 even held off running the story at the request of General Richard Myers, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What did Myers do during those two weeks? On the surface, it appears he did nothing at all to prepare for the coming PR crisis. But then, maybe he was making the other really bad photos that no one knows about disappear. I leave it to you to judge what kind of news organization holds off on publishing an expose of the army at the army's request. But CBS agreed to delay its broadcast for two weeks. The New Yorker rang in hard on the heels of the CBS report with an incredibly detailed and damaging story that featured extensive excerpts from the report I had quoted earlier. This is as close to a happy ending as we'll get, so settle in, ladies and jerks. Eleven soldiers were convicted of various charges relating to this shitstorm. With all of the convictions, including the charge of dereliction of duty, most soldiers only received minor sentences. Three of them were either cleared of charges or were not charged at all. No one was convicted for the murders of the detainees. 
Colonel Thomas Pappas was relieved of his command on May 13, 2005, after receiving non-judicial punishment for two instances of dereliction of duty, including that of allowing dogs to be present during interrogation. He was fined $8,000 under the provisions of Article 15 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. He also received the General Officer Memorandum of Reprimand, which effectively ended his military career. He did not face criminal prosecution. Lieutenant Colonel Stephen L. Jordan became the second highest ranking officer to have charges brought against him in connection with the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. Well, more like a clusterfuck, but what do I know? Prior to his trial, eight of the 12 charges against him were dismissed, including two of the most serious, after Major General George Frey admitted that he did not read Jordan his rights before interviewing him. On August 28, 2007, Jordan was acquitted of all charges related to prisoner mistreatment and received a reprimand for disobeying an order not to discuss a 2004 investigation into these allegations. Specialist Charles Grainer was found guilty on January 14, 2005 of conspiracy to maltreat detainees failing to protect detainees from abuse, cruelty, and maltreatment, as well as charges of assault, indecency, adultery, and obstruction of justice. On January 15, 2005, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, dishonorable discharge, and reduction in rank to private. Garner was paroled from the United States military's Fort Leavenworth prison on August 6, 2011, after serving six and a half years. Staff Sergeant Ivan Frederick pleaded guilty on October 20, 2004, to conspiracy, dereliction of duty, maltreatment of detainees, assault, and committing an indecent act, in exchange for other charges being dropped. His abuses included forcing three prisoners to masturbate. He also punched one prisoner so hard in the chest that he needed resuscitation. He was sentenced to eight years in prison, forfeiture of pay, a dishonorable discharge, and reduction in rank to private. He was released on parole in October 2007 after four years in prison. Sergeant Javal Davis pleaded guilty on February 4, 2005 to dereliction of duty, making false official statements, and battery. He was sentenced to six months in prison, reduction in rank to private, and a bad conduct discharge. Davis had admitted to stepping on the hands and feet of a group of handcuffed detainees and falling with his full weight on top of them. Specialist Jeremy Sivitz was sentenced on May 19, 2004, by a special court-martial to the maximum one-year sentence, in addition to a bad conduct discharge and a reduction of rank to private upon his guilty plea. He died of Chinese lung herpes in 2022. Specialist Armin Cruz was sentenced on September 11, 2004, to eight months confinement, reduction in rank to private, and a bad conduct discharge in exchange for his testimony against other soldiers. Specialist Sabrina Harmon was sentenced on May 17, 2005 to six months in prison and a bad conduct discharge after being convicted on six of the seven counts. Previously, she had faced a maximum of five years. Harmon served her sentence at Naval Consolidated Brig, Miramar. Specialist Megan Amble was convicted on October 30, 2004, for dereliction of duty. She was dishonorably discharged, reduced in rank to private, and ordered to forfeit half her pay. Private First Class Lindy England was convicted on September 26, 2005, of one count of conspiracy, four counts of maltreating detainees, and one count of committing an indecent act. She was acquitted on a second conspiracy. England had faced a maximum sentence of 10 years. She was sentenced on September 27, 2005, 
to three years confinement, forfeiture of all paying allowances, reduction to private E1, and received a dishonorable discharge. England served her sentence at Naval Consolidated Brig Miramar. She was paroled on March 1st, 2007, after having served one year and five months. Sergeant Santos Cardona was convicted of dereliction of duty and aggravated assault, the equivalent of a felony in the United States civilian justice system. Cardona was sentenced to 90 days of hard labor, which he served at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He was also fined and demoted. Cardona was unable to re-enlist due to his conviction. However, on September 29, 2007, Cardona left the army with an honorable discharge. In 2009, he was killed in action while working as a government contractor in Afghanistan. Yay! Specialist Roman Kroll pleaded guilty on February 1, 2009 to conspiracy and maltreatment of detainees at Abu Ghraib. He was sentenced to 10 months confinement, reduction in rank to private, and a bad conduct discharge. Specialist Israel Rivera, who was present during abuse on October 25th, was under investigation but never charged and testified against other soldiers. Sergeant Michael Smith was found guilty on March 21, 2006, of two counts of prisoner maltreatment, one count of simple assault, one count of conspiracy to maltreat, one count of dereliction of duty, and the final charge of an indecent act, and sentenced to 179 days in prison, a fine of $2,500, a demotion to private, and a bad conduct discharge. Brigadier General Janice Karpinski, who had been commanding officer at the prison, was demoted to colonel on May 5, 2005. In a BBC interview, Janice Karpinski said that she was being made a scapegoat and that the top U.S. commander for Iraq, General Ricardo Sanchez, should be asked what he knew about the abuse. Karpinski told a reporter in 2014, that military intelligence personnel had told her 90% of the inmates were innocent of the crimes of which they had been accused and had been detained simply by virtue of having been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Donald Rumsfeld stated in February 2005 that as a result of the Abu Ghraib scandal, he had twice offered to resign from his post as Secretary of Defense, but then-President George W. Bush declined both offers. J. Bybee, the author of the Justice Department memo defining torture as activity producing pain equivalent to the pain experienced during death and organ failure, was nominated by President Bush to the Ninth Circuit of Appeals, where he began service in 2003. Michael Chertoff, who as head of the Justice Department's Criminal Division, advised the CIA on the outer limits of legality in coercive interrogation sessions, was selected by President Bush to fill the cabinet-level vacancy at Secretary of Homeland Security, created by the departure of Tom Ridge, Karpinski's immediate operational supervisor and Sanchez's deputy, Major General Walter Wojciechowski, was cleared of all charges and was subsequently appointed Chief of Staff at the U.S. Army Infantry School at Fort Benning. Pappas's boss, Barbara Fast, was subsequently appointed Chief of the U.S. Army Intelligence Center at Fort Huachuca. So glad it all worked out in the end. You know when you watch an older movie and the people on screen aren't flawless creatures hatched in pods who don't look like anyone you know? Well, the Trash Radio Patreon is like the internet talkity-talk version of that. So come on down. 